Hey everybody, this is my herb garden, or what I like to now call it, my plant sanctuary. i got so many different kinds of plants in here. Mostly herbs, but also different kinds of flowers and wildflowers. These are going absolutely crazy over those comfries. Uh, I guess see if I can get a better look at them. There's one right there. And there's one right there. Right where? Hiding on there you are. They've been on this all day. Every day for the past two weeks or more. They love these flowers, the bumblebees especially. They're right at home here. They actually have a nest underneath there. So I see them going in and out of there. So I figured there's a bumblebee home under there somewhere. Couldn't ask for anything better than pollinators nest in your garden you want pollinated and I also put up my leaf cutter bee barn so these are leaf cutter bees they haven't woken yet they're still in they're still sleeping in their little cocoons but probably in another month start to see them wake up and flying in and out and then they'll be pollinating here too This garden used to be a very neat and tidy kind of a traditional garden. Actually used to look kind of plain, maybe a little bit boring. This year I've kind of let it take off and do its own thing. And just helped it along the way to do its own thing. And now it's like a thriving ecosystem of plants and bees and all other kinds of bugs. Just last night I looked in here, I was planting seeds at night, believe it or not. Because some the seeds I had gotten a little wet earlier, so I had to do something with them right away. And there were some worms making love somewhere around here. So that's good because the more worms in your garden, the better, because worms are so good for the soil. And this soil has seen significant improvements to how it was before. Before, it was like a very hard, rocky clay soil. And it wasn't very fertile. Now I can just like dig in it with my hands. I'll probably show you a better example right there so easy to just move around now so rich and crumbly and healthy and I think the reason because of that was because of all this mulch for one so I never used to believe in mulch until recently just this year I decided to put mulch down in this garden and I'm so glad I did so it's just a regular kind of a straw mulch with old straw and the, that's just one of the things that probably helped improve the soil structure but another thing which I firmly believe now is just letting a lot of these so-called weeds grow and not pulling them because for example these plantains here they help with soil compaction and what they grow where the soil is compact and they naturally loosen it up for you and a lot of weeds do that like dandelions and certain kinds of clover and so this is a very healthy soil I feel that I can just dig to my heart's content with my bare hands 
and before I couldn't even barely get a shovel down in there so dry and hard and rocky and that's because before I was cleaning out this bed every fall for the planting the next spring just so no weeds at all get in there I was it used to be a very traditional kind of a gardener everything had to look perfect and that was just so detrimental like the there was a time I had like no plants left in here because I wanted a clean slate for planting the next spring and I wasn't getting a very good garden out of this because the soil was so hard and the plants just didn't have a lot of nutrients or other ways to survive really because it was getting baked in the hot summer sun and they had no shade and but now after adding this mulch and letting some weeds grow and transplant just transplanting a lot of plants from just around the yard like my dad mows his lawn so but there was a lot of plants on the lawn that I actually liked that I wanted to keep around so what I did was I just transplanted a lot of them into here as like a sanctuary like my plants this is why I call it my plant sanctuary so that you can actually live happy productive lives like for example this these daisies these were on the lawn and they were just sticks before and I planted them here and look they're almost ready to even flower now same with the St. John's wort, like there was hardly anything. I saw St. John's wort there a few years ago and I was wondering where I can find it. I had a good idea, so I was searching on the lawn and I found these, just these little tiny pokies of little beat up sticks coming out of the lawn. And I was pretty sure it was the St. John's wort I had seen for. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to save this and put it in my garden. And now look at it. It's like so thankful. It's actually have a chance to live. If you don't know, St. John's wort is a natural antidepressant when taken as a herbal supplement. So it's helped me before with my sadness and depression. And now I have a chance to give back to it and help that plant with its depression and anxiety and all that and now I think it's, it's really thankful now that happy it's in here nice breeze coming it's so nice I think this is my favorite spot to hang out in this yard actually because I got all my plants like I even planted some hemps in here, so this isn't marijuana because it this is more of an industrial hemp. Like there's different kinds of hemp, some are not technically the industrial kind per se, but all these plants have very low concentrations of THC and high levels of CBD, so if you smoke them or do whatever you want with them, they won't get you stoned like marijuana does. It's more of a natural way to go about it, like so much emphasis is focused on growing plants with the highest possible THC concentrations because that's what society seems to want these days, but I don't want that because THC gives me so much anxiety and paranoia, but like I can handle little amounts of THC just fine, but high amounts I don't do well with like it's caused a lot of problems for me in the past and I've grown this hemp before and it's it's like a miracle plant because I could still get the benefits of cannabis without getting stoned out of my mind just nice and relaxing and it's more the essence more than anything like I like to think of it as like decaf coffee or non-alcoholic beer because it doesn't ha it doesn't get you high so just like decaf coffee doesn't give you the caffeine and non-alcoholic beer doesn't get you drunk same deal with these hemp plants now some hops growing here so I started these hops from seed oh 
three years ago now and they don't usually recommend you start hops from seed because if you do you could actually get like male and female flowers or plants rather that will cross pollinate and then you can get very seedy cones which are kind of undesirable for if you're brewing beer but I personally don't care like if I get any cones from these even if they are seedy I think I would be so happy with that because it would be the reward of actually growing these hops from seed so they take a long time to get established like it took a few years before they really got going and they got going good last year but this year they are really taking off and I'm sure this year they'll make it to the top of the string and they'll want to climb on top of the roof or because they have nowhere else to go but they're a fast grower once they're established so I'll, I'll imagine I'll get cones this year which would be great for brewing my own beer. I'll probably still brew an alcoholic beer because I'm fine with alcohol usually. It takes a lot for me to get messed up. And I, Other examples of plants that I transplanted from around the yard are these these thimble berries. So there's a whole patch of thimble berries there. And they're flowering now and I saw bees on them today too, which is pretty cool. But there were some thimble berries that were kind of coming up like over here where it gets mowed, so I wanted to save them just so they have a chance to live and kind of spread their roots. Like I'm, I'm actually taking an online course about wild harvesting and just plants, garden plants and edible medicinal kind of herbs in general. So it's just a kind of a self, self-learning kind of course. There's no deadline. Well, you can work at your own pace basically. And anyways, they, they were saying that plants that grow in a group like this when there are some that kind of spread out to the outside like those are the pioneers of these plants and they're exploring the boundaries to see where they can live next and these plants have been isolated for so long like they've been here my whole life we didn't plant them they just naturally were here and they've had a rough life but even last year so but this year I'm really taking care of them like I cleaned up a lot of the garbage and stuff that was just around in here there's, there's a lot of rocks but they they're doing fine with that now and I've even been watering them sometimes as a gesture like we want you here please do well and give us berries I love thimble berries I've always loved to eat thimble berries there's a bee in there looks like a little metallic sweat bee or some sort of sweat bee, maybe not necessarily a metallic one. But they're tiny, they're very cute. There's another bee over there, bumblebee. Somewhere. There she is. Hi. You cleaning yourself? Good job, little bee. Thank you. So there were several of those that came up in the lawn so I just today I just transplanted them into here somewhere for them to live and kind of branch out beyond their isolated kind of boundaries. And they were a little stressed at first but I watered them and they're doing so much better now. So I, there were even some raspberries that did the same thing down there they were just spreading out onto the lawn so I transplanted some raspberries to here as well. So she gets has raspberries. There's some right there, right there. This is some chamomile that I planted last year, and I didn't plant it this year because it self-sowed its seeds, and it's just growing from that. And now it's flowering. So anytime I guess I could harvest a few of these to make a cup of tea or whatever, but I'll, I'll definitely leave a lot of flowers for it to self-seed again so I get more chamomile coming back next year. And I got valerian here which I planted last year from seed. 
and it grew last year but now it's really growing and now they're just about to flower I think this one's just about ready to pop so that's great and the, today I just transplanted some lupins into here some mountain flowers like valerians grows in the mountains and so does lupins and also planted some columbines even though they're not herbs actually a kind of a poisonous flower but I I think that'll go great with a kind of a contrast just because this isn't just herbs like there's even vegetables in here like for example there's some carrot tops that I saved from cooking carrots and now I, I, I put them in a bowl, little shallow bowl of water and they grew leaves and then they grew roots and now I planted them and now I'm gonna get carrots which should flower and then I can save the seeds hopefully so that's the plan with those ones and there's even a broccoli kind of a head that I saved the bottom rather piece of stem and now it's growing leaves and that'll be a nice broccoli plant too some other vegetables I planted in here are some some random tomatoes just to see how they'll do like these tomatoes are more of an experiment than anything because oh hi hello just walking on the ground a little wet maybe sweetheart not sure what she's doing there maybe she's just resting or looking for water just just exploring like like if you think about it bees have lives just like us and we like to take a break from our jobs every once in a while and just go exploring or go on little hikes or whatever and I think that's what that bee is doing right now just because it's happy and it wants to have a good time and can't expect bees to work 24-7 like they need breaks just like we do anyways these tomato plants more of an experiment than anything because a lot of tr traditional kind of set in stone rules about gardening like the most popular kind of gardening is basically that all plants need to be a certain space apart and there can't be any weeds whatsoever or else your plants won't do well and they will not be productive they won't have fruit they'll be all stunted and small and but I'm just gonna see if that's a lie by planting these tomato plants here and if they do well then I'll know that all those things that they have kind of people have drilled into your mind over the years when it comes to gardening are actually false and that plants can thrive without the use of all these fertilizers and pesticides and constant weeding and plant spacing and all that kind of stuff so only time will tell how well these tomatoes do. I think they'll do just fine. But once these plants get bigger, they will be, it will be crowded in here, but the strongest plants are going to be the ones that come out on top for sure. But I, I think a lot of them are actually gonna be the strongest plants that come out on top. So we'll see. I'll keep you updated on how that goes. Some other plants planted in here are some cabbages so these are last year's cabbages that were in the vegetable garden and we didn't want them there when we were planting this year because cabbages are biennials so they go to seed in their second year flower and go to seed and these didn't do well there last year anyway so but so I transplanted them here just in my plant sanctuary and this cabbage over here is flowering already and it's going to make seeds as well. I've seen bees on them too. 
particularly these kales, which are another type of cabbage. And they're doing the same thing. So I could get crosses between cabbage and kale. And the same as this, this kale over here. It's uh it's really flowering, it's really happy right now. So let's see it's kale, so it's proof the leaves are proof that it's kale. I planted kale here last year and just for eating and now I'm letting it go to seed. And I can save the seeds and plant kale, cabbage. Um not sure what this was, but these are kind of these were kind of rogue brassicas that I think they were probably bok choys or were just regular mustard that kind of went wild and now it's already flowered and now it's going to seed so I don't think I had a chance to cross pollinate with the kale but I'm sure we'll get some interesting kind of plants out of that one. And this I believe is Canticum mustard. So that's a distant relative of these uh, cabbages and kales and all that. And it has the same kind of yellow flowers, only they're smaller. I don't think they can cross pollinate with these ones, but I've just been letting them flower because they're so pretty. Apparently you can eat them too. Don't take my word for it, but I'm pretty sure they're edible. Just like any kind of regular wild mustard, I guess. And I also got peas along the back, so you may have watched me in an early video, earlier video planting some some of the uh, King Tut purple peas, and here's how they're going so far. Growing, should, I should say, rather. So, it might be hard to see some of them because they're mixed in with other plants, but you get the idea. So, they're going to climb this netting, and I also planted a bunch of morning glories here today. So I think that'll look beautiful along this netting. Also, I actually planted some Hawaiian baby wood roses into the ground. And they're not babies and they're not made of wood and they're not roses. But they're rather another plant that's very similar to morning glories, only they're a lot larger. They have the same kind of trumpet shaped flowers, only they're a lot larger. And I think that'll look cool with the morning glories. I've never actually grown them before, so I started these a little earlier and now I planted them right in the ground. So they'll climb, hopefully they'll climb up and then make some flowers and then uh, just be another plant in my garden. Like they're an annual for this zone, so if I'm lucky enough to get flowers, that'll be great. But Otherwise, if I don't, it's still a nice plant to have kind of thing. Also in here, that might be hard to see. See if I can find an example, are tomatillos. So, they're kind of like a tomato, only they have kind of a papery husk. Not sure if I could find another example right there, tomatillo. So they're related to the golden berries you get at health food stores, so I planted some of those too. There would be one somewhere in here, uh, somewhere. A little hard to see because there are so many plants in here. It's hard to pin them out, but I think there's one like right there, if I'm not mistaken. No, maybe somewhere. And I also planted goji berries, so there'll be actual shrubs in a little while. And that'll be nice to have goji berry bushes here, if they survive. Never know what's going to really survive and what's going to, what's not, but you never know, like, it's, it doesn't hurt just to plant them just to see how they're going to do. I'm so interested to see how this garden is going to look in a little while. Like, even n this time next month, I'll definitely be giving an update around then because it's going to look so... Like, I just don't know what to expect. Like, I wasn't expecting this garden when I originally started out this year. But, this is better than I could have imagined it. It's only going to get better and better from there on out. And even, like, next season, like next year, I don't think I'll really have to plant 
anything in this garden other than a few annuals because there's already so many perennials in here that will keep coming back every year. So, for example, these are valerians or even the sage came back from last year and it's going to come back year after and the year after. Same with the oregano. And this is wormwood. I'm not sure. I think that's a perennial. So that'd be cool if that came back. But whether or not it's hard to the zone is another thing. Cannabis is an annual, but I did have a volunteer cannabis come just this year. So this is a volunteer. I did not plant this one. And it's a lot smaller than the other ones, but volunteer is a volunteer, so that's so cool. And this one, I just brought this outside today. This is a can of bonsai. So it's another kind of a ruderalis hemp plant. Purebred ruderalis seeds. And now I'm making it into a bonsai. So just by kind of bending it into place with like little pieces of wire into the ground just so that's really cool like I've seen pictures of these on Facebook or whatever and I think they're just so cool looking so this one is actually turning out really nice it's got a nice spiral kind of shape and and that was inside in just in my room all last ever since I started it and today I brought it outside so I want to see what it does now because it's under different conditions it's not under a grow light anymore it's actually out in the sun so we'll see what happens to it but I think that'll just add to the uniqueness of the plant over time here's my wild strawberries so I talked about this in my first video I had transplanted a bunch of wild strawberries and they flowered and they got pollinated and they dropped their flowers and now they would be making their berries right now so that was a success so that's the regular strawberry still has a bit of a flower but this one is already growing a little bit of a berry so that's actually a lot of a berry still green but I'll turn red soon enough these are normally ready around mid-June for here so whether or not I'll get hybrids is another question with this regular strawberry common strawberry but I might just have to save the seeds from these strawberries and then I might get a hybrid from the seed from the plants I grow from those seeds so we'll see the rhubarb is doing awesome so this poor rhubarb well used to be a poor rhubarb now it's doing much better it was day, way down in the corner over there and it's so hot and dry over there and it would come up in the early spring and then just kind of die back in the summer and it wasn't doing well like it would only ever get like six inches tall if lucky and over there is where the raspberries aren't doing well anyway so it's a very dry location lots of like nap weed and all that kind of stuff over there and you see raspberries get bigger and bigger and bigger all the way along to this end because there's more water there so anyways last year we moved this rhubarb over here I don't think I have a picture of it from before. I don't think I would be able to find one, but maybe we do. But anyways, I moved it here and it's looking so much happier here. It gets all the love and attention it could possibly get. All the water, of course, and and it's like, if you look at the stalks, nice healthy stalks, nice healthy leaves. So this will be eatable probably pretty soon. But I don't think I'm gonna eat it, I might well, I'll definitely eat it. Like, I'd like some in my birthday cake, actually. My, like, trifle for my birthday. So, throw a little bit of rhubarb into there. It should be perfect tenderness by that time. 
the rest of the plant I'm just going to let grow and get bigger and I'm hoping it'll eventually flower so then I can get seeds and I can save the seeds and plant more of that rhubarb. There, there's this uh, clover that's growing with the rhubarb. It's the regular kind of clover I guess. I think that's the tall variety if I'm not mistaken. And that was transplanted with the rhubarb last year and now that hasn't been being cut down it's getting really tall and rhubarb I mean uh, clover it's actually a type of legume so it fixes nitrogen into the soil it's like any kind of clover even beans for that for example and this rhubarb is gonna is getting all this all these nutrients from the clover and that's why it's another reason why it's doing so well I'm hoping the sage is gonna flower pretty soon maybe this year but love to be able to save my own sage seeds it's looking it's looking good it's not huge but that's okay because it's still a very nice sage it smells like sage all right it's definitely a nice I smell. I love making tea out of it. Normally I make tea out of sage. I, I don't use it in cooking a heck of a lot, but sometimes I do. But tea is my go-to way to use sage. Or you could just eat it. Just don't eat too much of it because it contains kind of a of a chemical compound called thujone and that's not good to have in high amounts so just if you're drinking tea out of sage use in moderation same with this wormwood it also contains thujone so if you're making absinthe or whatever don't drink too much of that because you can get too much thujone in your system and I think too much thujone actually kind of can cause, I believe, kind of stiffness or even in super high doses maybe convulsions or whatever. But I've never had problems with just having a little bit of sage tea every once in a while. And a lot of people do that. So yeah, I'm sure it's fine. All along in these bricks are Roman chamomile. So I mentioned this in my first video, and this Roman chamomile is a perennial, or is this chamomile, the German chamomile is an annual, and they're botanically different plants. They're distant cousins, but the flowers look pretty similar and the leaves look pretty similar. But this chamomile, the Roman stuff, is more bitter. I'm not a super huge fan of the taste of the tea, but smells amazing like I think this year I'm gonna make essential oils out of them so yeah I got this distillation unit that can be used to distill essential oils and so I already made lemongrass essential oils out of just some lemongrass herb I bought at the health food store so just a way to try it out basically and I got a pretty low yield from that but it all depends on the plant really. This might be very high in essential oil content. So I could probably have more of an absolute oil that way. So I think that would be a kind of a way to go. This one's looking nice. Nice and healthy. Big bush in the bricks. Fills in the gaps of the bricks. They have very pretty white flowers just like the regular German chamomile. Funny is this is actually known as true chamomile. So German chamomile isn't true chamomile. This is the true chamomile only it's not the common type of chamomile that you use in tea. Common type is the untrue chamomile which is the German. So that's what you get in your commercial teas any kind of tea that any kind of chamomile tea that you buy from a grocery store is going to be German chamomile and you almost never find 
Roman chamomile sold for tea, even at health food stores, like, normally it's made to make essential oils, I guess. Not sure why, it might be, just because it might be a little bitter for some people, it's not really desirable, but similar medicinal effects, like it can help with sleep and that kind of thing, too. But I think German chamomile might be a little better for sleep, I'm not sure. So this will be flowering soon. It flowered last year or so. so. That's great. So just waiting for it to flower again and that'll look nice. So this creeping Charlie has really taken off this year, which is good because I almost had it down to nothing when back in the days when I wanted my garden to look so neat and tidy. A lot of gardeners hate this plant because they think it's a little invasive and that it could because it just takes over just like any kind of mint really and it's a sprawling ground cover but I'm using this as a ground cover this year because to fill in the gaps and it just looks nice and it's mostly done flowering now so it had a lot of flowers lots of bees on them but I saw a bee on a flower today but they're pretty much done flowering but I love that plant and I love it for tea too, so. And the more it spreads, I think the better because it'll just make this garden look even more like a like a jungle, I guess. Well here's that catnip I had growing in the cage. So here's the catnip, it's just pushing up against the top. Anytime it pokes through, I just push it back down so cats don't get to it. So there's some right there. That's doing awesome. There's also stinging nettles in there and you had a bunch of clover like I think the other day I even found a four leaf clover in there somewhere. If I can show you at some I'm sure where it was. Anyways. That's where I saw it. And so the cats have not gotten to this, thank goodness. Not yet. But over here. They set out decoy catnip plants. And a cat did find this. And I saw it, we went on vacation and we came back and it was knocked over like this. And there's a whole bunch of little cat hairs. Not sure, they're mostly gone now, the rain probably washed them away. There's, there's some little hairs there. So evidence the cat's been there. They didn't destroy this plant. Luckily, but I don't think it matters because this is a decoy. So I just set this up to distract the cats from not even attempting to get into something that's difficult to get into. And they can play with this all they want and they leave my other plants totally alone, which is good. And it's just a nice plant to have here too. Like, I'm sure this will get really... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Destroyed, decimated, ruined eventually by other cats that find this later. And I think the older the plant gets to, the more likely cats are to find it because it emits more stronger smell, I guess. Planted some mountain mint in here, so it's a type of mint that I guess grows in the mountains some places. Smells like a mint, tastes like mint. It is a mint. It's not your traditional mint, but it can be used in a lot of the same ways. It's just regular common mint. So, it's the first year growing it and I started it from seed earlier spring or even late winter and it's doing well so far, so that's great. Just gonna put this mulch back. The mulch is what helps keep the ground fertile and healthy because it's locking in moisture and the moisture allows more microorganisms to thrive in there. It makes for a nice healthy soil structure. The healthier your soil, the better your plants are going to be. So after this mulch decomposes, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave all these plants in there over the winter 
everything, everything would die back in the winter and then it'll be a nice layer of dead plants on the ground which I'm going to leave the next spring completely and just let all the other plants grow from that and I would barely have to do anything here next year other than maybe plant a few random annuals but by doing that by leaving all the dead plant debris it acts as a natural layer of mulch which will do the same thing basically so I won't have to add straw next year and it's already worked out very well for me in the front gardens, like I'll, I'll show you over here. So here's the front garden boxes. If you see what I mean, I left all the dead plants in here. And look, all these other plants are growing from these... from this dead plant debris, all the natural mulch. And look, these, these boxes are really filling out now. Like I barely had to plant anything in here this year. A few things, but... Most of it is all volunteers, and it's the same. Most of it, the same plants that I planted here in previous years, and also some wildflowers that a lot of people would call weeds, like sorialism. But I call it a wildflower because it's wild and it's flowering, and it looks nice. And the only difference between a flower and a weed is a judgment. So even in this garden there's a lot of weeds growing here as you may have noticed but I personally don't like to use that term because a weed is really any plant that's unwanted and personally for me all of these plants in here I want. I want everything that everything that's growing in here everything weed or not regular plant or herb for that matter vegetables flowers even the invasive regular plants like the creeping charlie I all want that in here so I wouldn't personally call these weeds I would call them wildflowers more than anything because that's what they are is like before anyone came up with the concept of weeds, these were growing out in the wild, and they were flowers. Just like this one, this sow thistle makes pretty yellow flowers. Kind of like little dandelions almost. And these are edible too. So this might be a little bit of a lot for, but way you can tell south thistles you can cut them or break them they excrete kind of a milky sap and this is a characteristic also of this plant over here which is wild lettuce and it does the same thing so kind of maybe I break a leaf or something yeah see this does the same thing but the way you can tell the difference wild lettuce can have serrated leaves like these but they aren't as pokey but this one has a whole bunch of little hairs along the stem of the leaf I'm not sure if you could see but they're very little spiny hairs. This one really doesn't have that. So that's how you identify sow thistle from wild lettuce. Wild lettuce is the more desirable one to eat. Actually has a lot of medicinal uses. It's actually also known as opium lettuce because believe it or not the white sap has some of the same kind of medicinal effects pain-killing effects as opium but it's not as powerful it's not as dangerous it's a lot safer actually and it's a lot milder effects than regular opium and it isn't addictive at all so that's important to mention so anyone who is coming off like either 
illicit or prescription painkillers, wild lettuce would be a good option because it could ease your withdrawal symptoms. So that's just kind of a little tidbit of information. If you may or may not find that helpful, but just thought I should mention. So anyways, I had saved these thistles from the lawn. They were just growing on the lawn. I think some deer had originally eaten them and then the thistles sprouted from seeds that were in their droppings basically. And then grew into thistles on the lawn which are not good if you're walking on the lawn in your bare feet. And these thistles were getting mowed over all the time anyway so I thought why not put them in my plant sanctuary where they can be free to grow up as happy as they want and they're not getting stepped on all the time and obviously I'll have to be careful when I'm in here harvesting plants but I know where they are so I can avoid them that way. And there's also another kind of thistle in here. These are the milk thistles. I planted these from seeds and they're they're more medicinal than the other kinds of thistles, but they can be used to cleanse the liver and all that kind of stuff. Good thing to note, if you ever ingest a poisonous mushroom and you get really sick or you're about to die, it's a good idea to eat this milk thistle because that's the antidote to poisonous mushrooms. So remember that if you're ever made the mistake of eating some wrong misidentified mushroom that's about to kill you. And they recommend you actually chew the seeds, swallow the seeds, because that's the most potent. But in an emergency, if you just have the plant available, eat the plant no matter how pokey it is because it could save your life. I grew milk thistles before in the front garden, the patio boxes. And there were ants that were swarming all over it. Like they loved that thistle. And there were so many ants. I, uh, you should have been there. Like there were a lot of ants. And hopefully this attracts more ants to my garden because I love ants. I used to kind of have a bit of a phobia of ants, but now they're my friends and I've learned to live among them and they don't bother me so much anymore because I've learned to accept them for who they are. Let's see if I can find some. There was an ant's nest somewhere a few years ago. Oh, there's an ant. Hello, how are you? Hi, don't be scared. Sorry. Okay. Anyways, there was an ant's nest here. And they might be making a new nest there, but a long time ago, well, not that long ago, when I was a little younger and dumber. I would try to destroy any ants' nests I found in my garden because I thought they would wreck my plants somehow, but I realized that's just wrong. Like, ants are actually very good pollinators. Like, they're probably even just as beneficial as bees as pollinators, even though they don't really get the credit for it. I'm not sure why. Probably because a lot of people think that ants are bad for your garden somehow. Like, one thing they can do is farm aphids in your garden. So they actually, ants will protect aphids and milk them for their, for their goodies, I guess. And the ants protect the aphids and the aphids will actually be more populous on your plants. And so that's a lot of problems people have with ants is just because there's they can protect aphids and aphids are technically bad for plants but I don't think that's going to be a problem in this garden because I'll have so many beneficial insects coming here there's going to be ladybugs and there's going to be probably like lace wings and hoverflies for sure because I have so many plants that hoverflies love like chamomile and all that. Hello bee. See you found my Brussels sprout. Yeah, so this anyways, my first video I made of I showed that that Brussels sprout that survived the winter in the big garden. 
So I transplanted it into here and now it's bolting and making flowers. Now there are bees on them. So I'll get seeds from the Brussels sprout and they should cross pollinate with my kale hopefully so I can get a weird hybrid between Brussels sprouts and kale and cabbage. So we'll see what I get from these seeds. It should be interesting. Should be interesting indeed. Stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is actually a very misunderstood plant because really you just have to be gentle with it and it won't sting you. Like I'm doing this and it's not stinging me the slightest. So be very gentle. It's just like little petting, but it's not stinging me. Just like bees. If you don't provoke the bees, they won't sting you. They'll mind their own business. Just like stinging nettle. Don't provoke the stinging nettle, and it won't sting you. Same, same idea. So over here I have some anise hyssop. And I bought that plant at the nursery where I worked last year and planted it here and now it's coming back this year. It's a very nice kind of a herb. Another mint family plant. And it smells a lot like licorice. Like anise, I guess. And very minty too. Very unique smell. But it's an excellent herbal tea as well. So bees just love it too. So. Back here is where more things are going on. So here's my skull cap herb that I planted. I did it right here. It's doing excellent. Here's my Japanese catnip. So shouldn't worry about cats getting that because they don't really care for it, I guess. And here is my, my whole bunch of lemon balm. And I love lemon balm, but haven't been successful growing it for like this is a lemon balm, I think. So oh, that's a catnip. Oh, where's the lemon balm? Somewhere. Maybe this one? That's oh, lemon balm. So I planted lemon balm seeds here last year. And then only one seemed to come up this year that I can see. But then I started a bunch early and transplanted them here a couple weeks ago. Or maybe just last week or whatever. I'm not sure now. Lost track of time these days, kinda, and they're doing well there too, so it's a good place. They like a shaded location, which is great. Over there is some dead nettles, there might be a type of purple dead nettle, I'm not exactly sure. And I want those to spread, so there's a couple spearmints there, and there's another dead nettle right there. It's got more purpley leaves. And I took those as cuttings from my grandma's garden and I rooted those cuttings and now I planted them and they're doing great here. So hopefully they spread a little more and be fruitful and multiply. This is technically what a lot of people would call an invasive weed. I got this identified as flixweed. And don't know a heck of a lot about it. Like I read about it, but I kind of forgot now. But I know it's what it's called is flixweed. And I'm just gonna let it grow here because I was trying to figure out what it was for so long, and so many people didn't know what it was. And some fin finally identified it on one of those plant ID boards. It's flixweed, and it's a very cool, very pretty flowers. Very cool plant in general, so I'm just going to keep it here. Maybe I'll get more flixweed in the future. That's great. These, I believe, are Dyer's Chamomile. I think, pretty sure. And they are kind of like chamomile, only they have orange flowers. And the orange flowers can be used as a type of a natural dye. So you can dye, like tie dye t-shirts or I think it might be an edible dye as well 
So you could probably use it for food coloring. Not sure. I'm sure there's other things you can use it maybe for I don't know what, but I'll have to look into that because especially when it spreads more I might have to find what I can do with it. Make a dye or something. That's why they call it dyer's chamomile. I don't think you could really use it for tea though. It's more of just a dye, I think. There's some verbena, also known as vervain. And it's come along nicely. It's an ingredient used in a lot of herbal teas. Most of that in herbal teas though is lemon verbena and this is just a regular kind of vervain. Common vervain or something. And I've never grown that before, but it'd be interesting to see how it turns out. Over here is that mother wart. You may have remembered it from my first video, if you're paying attention. And this is going to grow really tall, so be a nice contrast with these tall hemp plants, because unlike marijuana, usually hemp grows super tall, so it can... I've seen it go up to like almost 12 feet tall, but some fields it can grow almost 30 feet tall versus a marijuana plant that only grows like maybe 4 feet tall maximum but I've, I've seen like other pictures that, like it, it all depends on how they grow them but on average marijuana doesn't get much higher than 3 feet usually this can grow very very tall the hemp and it can grow like almost as high as that roof like I'm no joking like almost as that probably to the bot the top of that window there is how tall it's probably gonna get it gets really tall anyways this motherwort gets very very tall too when it's like fully grown it actually looks very similar to hemp in a lot of ways make it it just has that similar appearance so it grows really tall and has the kind of same kind of similar kind of leaves but obviously different medicinal effects. You may have noticed that there's actually a lot of grasses growing in this garden but that doesn't bother me at all. So a lot of people say oh get rid of all your grass because it'll choke out all your plants and but I'm being a little rebellious this year leaving all the grass that wants to grow in here to grow in here because I've had so many problems in the past fighting grass in this garden it always comes back stronger and harder than before and before when the soil was so hard and compact the grass would just have a long trailing root and every time you pull it it rips up other plants and pulling it seems to have done more harm than good so but Look how well this garden is doing so far, and all this grass is in here. And it's not affecting it one bit, like, think about it in nature. There's like, just in nature in general, so. There would be grass growing everywhere, and plants are growing everywhere in that grass. And the grass doesn't choke out the plants in a natural setting, so why would it in my garden? So obviously it'll be interesting to see the end result, how the grass has coexisted with these plants. But I think it'll be just fine. And I, I think the grass will actually kind of act as ground cover and a living mulch that you can cut back like a chop and drop and leave it on the ground and be more like a mulch that is renewable because it keeps coming back all the time like you cut the grass on the lawn and it keeps growing back just like this grass in the garden so if I went with scissors and just snipped these plants and left them on the garden bed like that that's just like a regular mulch just like this straw and it's re it's renewable like I said and it'll have the same benefits as regular mulch and it also since it's green it'll be like kind of like a green manure almost that'll break down and 
provide more nutrients to the plants and make for healthier plants. So I see this grass as more of a blessing than a curse now. And obviously this is, I'm also calling this kind of my experimental garden. Because there's a lot of experiments that I'm just challenging the status quo when it comes to gardening. And I'm making these experiments to see how wrong a lot of the ideas of what's been drilled into people's minds of how gardens should be, how they should look, how they should be grown basically. And I'm hoping to prove a lot of that stuff wrong because I don't agree with a lot of that stuff anyway. So if grass turns out to not choke out plants, that could be groundbreaking in a lot of ways. This is an oriental poppy that was a transplant that was transplanted here when my nanny moved away and she wanted me to have this plant because it's been in the family for a long time and I was worried it wasn't going to transplant well that maybe it would just die and I thought it died last summer but Turns out it came back right nice and healthy this spring. And it's got nice healthy leaves and I don't think it might not flower this year. I don't see a flower stalk that I can see. That's okay, it just was transplanted last year so maybe next year it'll make flowers, we'll see. Over down here is a patch of self heal, also known as heal all. And I had saved these plants from the front lawn because they were always getting mowed down and they wouldn't have time to make flowers. And so I just grabbed a big clump of it and just put it in the, in the plant sanctuary so that I have my, one of my favorite medicinal herbs right available to me in time I need some healing done. So these self-heal is actually very good for healing any kind of ailment you can imagine. It just promotes your body's natural healing process. And you don't need to use a lot of it, like just eat a couple of these or make a mild tea. It's not a strong flavor, it's actually a type of mint but it doesn't taste very all that minty. It's a very very mild flavor but it's like super powerful in its effects so it's very special. And they make these little purple flowers. The flowers actually look quite a bit like these flowers. I don't know if you've seen them before. I'll probably show you a picture of what they look like in flower. But I think this is an excellent addition to this herb garden because it's really a great herb. So here's a closer look at it. Definitely self heal because I harvested it from that location before. And it's it's a mint family plant, Lamiaceae, whatever it's called. And you can tell because they have square stems and they have the classic mint florets kind of there, opposite leaves like that. So. I'm going to pick some of these because I need a little bit of healing done because I actually actually bruised my knee pretty bad today I don't know if you could see but hit my knee with a kind of a back of an axe when I was pounding in a post down in my yugo culture because a bear had gotten into there and kind of destroyed it and one of the posts was broken so I was hammering the post back in it hurt my knee in the process. Thankfully it wasn't the sharp end of the axe that hit. But if I just eat some of these leaves, I'm sure I'll feel much better. My knee's still pretty sore right now. And it's a great 
That's a great leaf. Yeah. Tastes good and it's good for you, so. That'll help for sure. Speed up the healing process. Bees. These bees are so happy. And they're about to get even happier because once all these flowers start blooming, if there's only a few that are blooming right now, it's beginning of June right now. The comfrey is out and these bees are swarming around the comfrey basically because they love comfrey, the bumblebees especially. Once the other flowers bloom, this is going to be kind of like a mecca of bees and other pollinators and it'll be so amazing, especially with my leaf cutter bees. So these are small solitary bees. They live in a nesting block in little leaf cocoons. And they're very small, they're very cute and they're super pollinators. They don't make honey and they don't have a queen either but they're super friendly and they're adorable really and they just want to be your friend and they love pollinating all flowers mostly for the most part but their favorite food is alfalfa and so I planted some alfalfa all in here so that acts as a cover crop and also a ground cover I guess it's the same thing technically but these leaf cutter bees just love it they make they actually cut the leaves in little circles and use it to build their little leaf cocoons and they also love the taste of the flowers I guess the nectar they get from the alfalfa so this would be an alfalfa some alfalfas here over here that's one over there. Kind of everywhere here. A lot of them probably still under this mulch. They'll grow, they're fast growers so they'll grow and the so leaf cutter bees are hatching. There should be some alfalfa flowers ready and they'll be all over that. So that should look amazing and all these other plants. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in how this garden's going to grow up to be. So that's very exciting for me because I really don't know what to expect. Imagine however it turns out it'll be better than I could possibly imagine it. Especially with all the bees that are going to be here and other pollinators like hopefully I get some butterflies. Well, I will get some butterflies, but there's a certain butterfly that would be so special to see. Monarch butterfly. This is on the edge of their range, basically, like the very cusp of their range. And I planted some milkweed in here. So there's a milkweed there. One right there. Pretty sure that's what they are. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, milkweed is the monarch butterfly's favorite flower. I think that's how they reproduce. They have a symbiotic relationship with the milkweed. And if there are any monarchs anywhere, anywhere here, they would find this milkweed. And if I saw one, that would be so special to me. I'm not going to keep my hopes up for that because they're pretty rare and they're in, I, th I believe they're actually an endangered species now so so I, I'm, I'm not going to count on actually seeing one but if I do that would be unbelievable and I'll, I'll definitely take some pictures of those if I do end up seeing them. I also transplanted this white clover in here today that was just growing on the lawn somewhere around here but I wanted to save that one too, so I just planted it in here. And it's got a couple flowers, so I might drop seeds and make more. But I'm sure I already have some of it growing in here, it just hasn't bloomed yet. Because this was the first one I've even seen this year, so... 
I have lots of different kinds of clover in here. And some of it's the black medic stuff. So for example, leave this stuff. It has little yellow flowers somewhere. Yeah, this over here. This is a type of clover called black medic. And it has little yellow flowers. And it's actually related to alfalfa. So alfalfa is another kind of clover as well. And so I got a lot of that here and there. So I bet my leaf cutter bees would like that as well. But I'm sure I have, like I have those tall clovers there obviously too. I forget what they're called, but they're pretty tall and bushy. But uh, I'm pretty sure I'd probably have some of those white clovers growing in there somewhere like, I, even like the red clovers or the pink ones for that matter. This might be what that is. So growing in the cage with the catnip and the stinging nettle. So I have lots of varieties of clovers in here. Clovers are good, like a lot of people see them as weeds, but they are excellent nitrogen fixers as well. And I do believe that the more clovers I have in here, the better my soil is going to be. Because they loosen up soil compaction as well. And they make the soil more nutrient dense, I guess, for the plants. Right in the back, I just noticed this now, I have the infamous dog bane, which is also known as Indian hemp, but it's in no way obviously related to this kind of hemp. They just call it hemp because you can make like ropes out of the stalks and all that kind of stuff. And so, it's Indian hemp, or dogbane rather, was really growing in here over the years and I've always been pulling it and pulling it because I just thought it was like a weed and it was impossible to pull because it would always break at the bottom and it would always come back, but I'm not even, I'm not gonna pull any weeds from here this year unless they're in the way of something that I want to plant, but I'm going to let everything grow, including these dog beans. And dog beans are very pretty pink flowers too, and I'm sure bees love them as well. So, And I hope a lot of them grow back, like just kind of reclaim their home turf, I guess. Same with these lilies. So. These have been here for years and years. These were here when the house was bought 30 years ago or so. And they've probably been here even a long time before that previous owners had planted them. And I tried, like, back when I was trying to make my garden so neat and tidy, clean up in the fall for planting in the spring, I tried to get rid of them but it was impossible because the roots, the bulbs rather, were so clumped together and they were just hard as rock and broke a couple shovels in the process. And, and I'm so glad I didn't get rid of them because they are truly an amazing plant. They make very beautiful orange flowers and I'm glad that they're still here. Like, glad I didn't succeed with my plan to get rid of them. And, no, I definitely would never attempt that ever again with with anything in here. Like, I'm just going to leave everything to its own device and they can compete and they can kind of be friends with, if they're companions or they're enemies. They just kind of have to learn to get along. Everything in here is going to have to learn to get along somehow. And then I, once it's... Once these plants are in their prime, it'll be definitely interesting to see how it looks like. Even in the fall when everything is grown up and I would love to see what it just looks like. Like that and how much it's improved since it used to be just even last year. Nick will throw in a couple photos from last year of how this looked. 
how it looks this year. And even though this might not be as tidy as last year, I think this looks way, way better. And it's much more natural. So these pictures were taken about two weeks from now or so. But this time, last that, two weeks from now, last year. And this garden now is already way further along with most plants than it was last year, two weeks from now. Mostly because I have more variety of plants in here. Like the hemp isn't as tall yet, but it will get to that point in two weeks. But a lot of plants, they just seem happier in here in a lot of ways. I think it was so hot and dry. Like we had a heat dome last year. Like last summer was the hottest summer in recorded history basically. We got like almost something like 48 degree Celsius weather. And it was so hot and plants really struggled like even in the big vegetable garden uh, th this is more of a traditional garden it's not my garden really but I helped build it but this garden doesn't have any mulch or any weeds really growing in it's more of a traditional straight row kind of garden which is what my family likes to do anyways and I like to help with it too but we really had to water this one like a hawk because otherwise the plants would never have made it. But this year is turning out to be a much cooler, wetter year and it's very nice weather most days. So I don't think we're going to have another heat dome hopefully. Better knock on wood. And so even this garden will probably do a lot better than it did last year. But anyways, last year there was so much exposed bare soil and not a lot of variety of plants sheltering each other, keeping the soil moist and cool and anything like that. And This year is much different because not only the weather's a lot better, there's a nice cool breeze blowing right now, but the soil structure is significantly better like like just like I showed you earlier I can just dig in the soil with bare hands basically even with a shovel it's like a lot easier to than it was before and it's just the kind of soil that really crumbles in your hands and it's all it's all really good and fertile now so this has been a healing process, not only for this garden, but also for me. Like I've had a lot of hardships in recent years and gardening has really been a kind of a way for me to, this is a place to go and feel better and do my own thing, kind of just be happy in general. I'm much happier with the way I'm gardening now compared to how it's been before, even though it was making me much happier before, but this way, this year is turning out to be a lot better, so that's great. Anyways, thanks for watching and hope you enjoyed my tour of my plant sanctuary slash experimental garden slash herb garden. Hope you found this educational or just plain informative really. Hope you learned a few things and till next time, happy growing.